Great. Well, it's a real pleasure to be back in Athens. Uh, we, we themed the presentation with a very Athens classics theme, by the way. You can see the nice, nice pillars, right? Um, so I'm going to share with you a few slides on this 11th anniversary of Satoshi Nakamoto's now famous white paper. Uh, from, share with you some slides from our recent investment thesis. Um, how many of you in the audience own some cryptocurrency? Okay, you're, you're already part of the religion, you've been converted, right? So, okay. And there's a few of you who do not, yeah? Who, who can, yeah. You are part of the majority, uh, <laughs> the vast majority, uh, as we're going to talk about uh, right now. And we're going to talk about why the vast majority of people still do not own crypto assets. Um, tens of millions of people own crypto assets today. The estimates range from anywhere from 30 million to as many as 60 million or more. We still think it's under 100 million people, but tens of millions of people. And that's an amazing accomplishment given that cryptocurrency, uh, the Bitcoin cryptocurrency has only been around for less than uh, 11 years. It was launched on the 3rd of January 2009. So billions of people, though, still don't own crypto assets. Why not? Why do you not own crypto assets? Well, the title of this talk, I think, should have given you a clue of where I was going this, with this trust, want, and need. But let's start with how many people are aware of crypto assets. So the New York Federal Reserve uh, published some survey data earlier this year, and awareness is not the problem. 85% of Americans know about Bitcoin. The Bank of Canada published a similar statistic, 85% of Canadians. Awareness is very high. The vast majority of people around the world have now heard of Bitcoin. And yet, most people do not own crypto assets. Why? Well, in the New York Federal Reserve survey, the number one reason given for why people do not own crypto assets is because they think it's a bad investment. All right? It's a bad investment. But when you ask the people, the 5% who do own crypto assets, why they do so, they say it's a good investment. So we have a paradox at the heart of crypto asset adoption. Most people think it's a bad investment. A small minority think it's a good investment. Which of these two views is correct? They can't both be right, or can they? Well, they are both right. If you think about Bitcoin as an investment in 2018, it was the worst investment. <laughs> it lost over 70% of its value last year. And oh, by the way, that was only the sixth biggest price decline in Bitcoin's history. All right, it's dropped over 90% on two occasions, uh, over 80% on another occasion. So over a short enough time period, it can be a really bad investment. But if you zoom out, and if you look at it over a multi-year period, it has been the very best investment that people have made. So it's important to understand you know, uh, how these seemingly contradictory views can actually both be true and how that can uh, lead to people not wanting to purchase their own crypto assets. Now let's get into the meat of the presentation, trust. After the view that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is a bad investment, trust or the lack thereof was the second reason cited for why people don't own crypto assets, a lack of trust. Now why don't people trust crypto assets? Now, this could be because of the many famous hacks of exchanges like Mt. Gox and others. It could also be due to complexity. All right, this is one of my favorite early uh, diagrams that was, was, was put together. It's very small, don't try to read it. The whole point of this uh, is to just tell you how complicated cryptocurrency is and how if you try to show this like I did to my mother, uh, and say, hey, Mom, hey, that's how cryptocurrency works. You can just read and follow the, the little uh, you know, mouse uh, kind of uh, path there to the end. You'll understand Bitcoin, no problem. This is very complicated stuff, all right? You know, and most people don't understand money, all right? I've been teaching cryptocurrency in universities and corporate classes for over six years now. And one thing that is very, very clear 
is that even executives at companies in financial services do not know where money comes from. It doesn't grow on trees. Not anymore, at least in the UK. Everything's plastic now. We have plastic banknotes, no longer paper banknotes. But when you ask uh, a group, where does money come from, rarely do I get the correct answer, which is that the vast majority of our money today is created by banks through the process of loans. When you go and ask for a mortgage, new money is lent into existence. That's where money comes from. That's where 95% of money comes from. 5% comes from the central bank. The rest of it is created by banks. Most people don't know that. And you'll never understand cryptocurrency and Bitcoin until you first understand money. So we've got a huge education gap. Now, just because something's complicated doesn't mean people won't use it. The internet famously was seen as, what is the internet? How does that work? Um, email, most people don't understand what the simple mail transfer protocol is, the SMTP protocol that makes emails work and is interoperable across different email clients and platforms. But it's just email. It's not value, right? So maybe people are a little more comfortable trusting something like email because it's not their money at stake. In other words, don't underestimate the user interface challenge of driving cryptocurrency adoption. It's a big challenge. It's what companies uh, like mine, blockchain, are laser focused on. Okay, so after trust, need was the third biggest reason cited for why people don't own cryptocurrency. Bad investment, number one lack of trust, number two, and number three, lack of need. I don't need this stuff, right? What does that mean? Well, it's famously very hard still to say buy a cup of coffee in most places with Bitcoin. It's getting easier with stable coins linked to ATM cards and so on and so forth, but it's actually still pretty hard. And most people don't want to spend their Bitcoins, frankly, uh, to buy a cup of coffee, both for transaction fee reasons as well as the thought that these are going to appreciate in value. Um, very few people are paid their, their salaries, by the way, uh, in cryptocurrency. That's, in my opinion, one of the biggest barriers to wider cryptocurrency adoption and use is when people start getting paid in crypto, they'll start using it for everyday transactions, right? That's, that's a big one. Now, there are compelling uses for cryptocurrency today. Uh, I think the biggest is Bitcoin's uh, ironic status as the scarcest hardest asset in history. I say ironic because it's a completely virtual asset that is actually the hardest uh, asset, harder than gold when you think about it from a scarcity perspective. And people are starting to become increasingly attracted to uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin for their macroeconomic hedging uh, use. Um, and stable coins, which we talked about last year when I spoke, uh, and this has very much been the year of the stable coin with Facebook's Libra announcement with what the People's Bank of China maybe announcing later this year, are also helping people start to use cryptocurrency to need and, and, and actually want to, to have cryptocurrency. Uh, today you can earn pretty significant annual interest rates lending your stable coins to DeFi platforms, uh, five, even 10%, which is, uh, is quite interesting. So the last uh, kind of verb uh, around crypto asset adoption that I want to cover is want. Do people want to own this stuff? You know, Warren Buffett, he doesn't like cryptocurrency, right? He doesn't like it. He dislikes it. He does not want this to succeed. Now, asking Warren Buffett what he thinks about Bitcoin is like asking a taxi driver uh, what they think about Uber coming to their, to their town, right? Warren's heavily invested in the traditional financial services sector, so of course he doesn't like this stuff, right? But there's a lot of reasons why people don't want it. Um, partly, it's just hard to come by. Uh, it's difficult to acquire. Buying cryptocurrency is still actually a really relatively painful process in many parts of the world. And mining it is even more complicated. Trying to earn your salary uh, with cryptocurrency, if you go to your employer and say, hey, I'd like to be paid in Bitcoin, I'd be curious what their reaction uh, would be to you. Uh, they might fire you on the spot because they say, I thought you were smart. I hired you for your, your smarts. You want to buy a cryptocurrency? You want to get paid in something that can drop in value 30% or 70, 80% a year. Um, but cryptocurrency companies like blockchain and others do actually give their employees the ability to, to get paid in cryptocurrency, but I'm not aware of any major corporations outside of the crypto industry that offer that. So that leaves uh, the fourth way to acquire cryptocurrency, airdrops, is the easiest way to gain access. Uh, that has the least uh, 
kind of pain, uh, I think, for many people to gain access to cryptocurrency. And blockchain uh, gave away over $100 million worth of cryptocurrency for free, free through an airdrop to our users this year. And we're going to be continuing that because we think this is a key way to drive crypto asset adoption, to get crypto in the hands of people so they can start using it. The other thing that causes people to not want to see cryptocurrencies grow and succeed is their environmental impact. And here I'm talking specifically about proof of work and especially Bitcoin and the very high energy consumption of Bitcoin. This is a legitimate concern. I get this question constantly from media. Uh, we do know that you know, a very significant amount of coal is used in China uh, to power Bitcoin mining during the dry season when uh, mining rigs migrate from Sichuan province up north. Um, this is a real issue, and we need the industry to come together and be more transparent about sources of electricity, how much of, uh, of the electricity that's powering networks like Bitcoin is coming from uh, renewable sources, and so on and so forth. This kind of information the mining industry has been reluctant to provide uh, to researchers like myself. We need to be more transparent. That's a big issue, especially for millennials and others who are very concerned, rightfully so, in my opinion, about the future of the environment. But there is a big driver that is getting people to want to own crypto assets. And this is the old kicking the can down the road uh, issue that we see in places like Europe, uh, in other countries, other places with unsustainable levels of debt. This is something that is driving more adoption, uh, the fact that we can use things like cryptocurrency as a, a hedge. OK, so just to wrap up, and then hopefully we'll have time for a question or two. Um, you can think about the challenges of cryptocurrency adoption as both internal challenges. So these are the five things that the cryptocurrency industry can really focus on and improve uh, inside our own house, if you will, that can increase currency adoption. We already talked about user experience, making uh, the process of owning crypto assets easier, uh, helping people manage their private keys. Uh, very interesting work going on there by companies like ours and others. Uh, monetary policy, this is where stable coins have a, a role to play. Uh, creating more stable, less volatile uh, crypto assets to own and use. Uh, scalability, I think Facebook's uh, Libra project was a massive endorsement of, of blockchain technology's capabilities to scale up to potentially billions of users. There's been a lot of progress in scalability. We still need uh, to do more work there. Fungibility and privacy, striking the right balance, very, very tricky. Lots of questions around what happens if cryptocurrencies uh, you know, become too, too private. Uh, will law enforcement crack down? Uh, we shall see. And then governance uh, is going to be an ongoing challenge, how to properly govern and manage open source blockchain projects. Uh, that's a great field uh, for you young people there to kind of focus on, because I think that's going to be a persistent challenge. Um, and then externally, these are the external challenges. We talked about education. We, we've got a lot more work to do with education. It's one of the reasons I'm very happy to come uh, and support the University of Nicosia and other educational institutions uh, as we educate people not just about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, but also about what is money and where does it come from. Uh, regulatory clarity, Facebook is really forcing the issue with Libra. We're having conversations amongst ministers, central bankers that just weren't happening prior to Libra. And it's forcing, I think, policymakers to really create more clarity around how the crypto asset space is going to be allowed to grow. Uh, we have competition. Look, traditional banks and fintech unicorns aren't just sitting back waiting to let cryptocurrency companies kind of take over the world, right? They're pushing back, they're fighting back, doing very innovative things around no-fee trading. Uh, you know, Schwab recently announced they moved to a no-fee model. Uh, that's creating a lot of competition for, for this sector. And then finally, inertia. You know, just getting people to change their behavior is hugely, hugely difficult. I can't stress this point enough. Usually something needs to be 10x better, 10x faster, better, cheaper, to get people to change from the way they're currently doing something to something new. And that's why people tend to keep their bank accounts for life. It's like luggage. You never get rid of it. <laughs> right? OK, so I think we've got just a, a little bit of time for a question. Um, yes? Steve Barker, Swap Forex. Um, Nouriel Rabini today in The Guardian had a, an article about um, uh, essentially central banks having to kind of use, you know, extraordinary measures in the, in the next recession that comes and effectively talking about helicopter money and things like that. So 
is is your kind of you know you're talking about adoption and things like that is is adoption going to come from like disaster like i i the central banks having to kind of basically debase the fiat monetary base and people looking for an alternative I think it is coming from that, but I'm glad you raised that point because that's another reason why people don't like cryptocurrency and don't want it, because it forces them to think about all these negative things that they don't want to think about anyway, like financial crises, you know, sovereign defaults, political collapse. These aren't things people like to spend their time thinking about, this negativity. So this pushing a real negative message constantly about why you need to buy Bitcoin is a real turnoff to a lot of people. That's not how people like to where they want to spend their, their mental time. Yeah. Time for one more. How do you think the emerging markets might, um, do you think that might be a faster way for it to get to market with um, digital currencies and the adoption of it? So in theory, yes. One of the first papers I, I wrote uh, was called the Bitcoin Market Potential Index, I think in 2014. Uh, ranking countries, 180 countries uh, across 40 different variables uh, that could drive cryptocurrency adoption. And the main takeaway was that it was Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the former Soviet countries uh, that, that really had the most to gain from a pure utility perspective with adopting crypto assets. However, we've seen a lot of uh, adoption in Western Europe, you know, in the United States, uh, Canada, China more developed uh, economies. So there's a bit of, a, again, a paradox here with where we've seen crypto asset adoption take place and where, in theory, it, it ha offers the greatest utility. Now, there is obviously, I think, good evidence that Argentinians and even Venezuelans are increasingly using and owning crypto assets, but uh, the, the penetration and the sheer numbers pale uh, in those places compared to a country even like the United States. For more, yeah. yeah. For you, what's the, uh, how much percent it will be an, an adoption, serious adoption? And the other question is. Uh, Sorry, what percentage of people? Uh, yeah, and the other yeah. question, how many years? That's an estimation. Right. So, uh, you know, in the United States, it's estimated that between five and nine percent of of U.S. citizens, adults, uh, own cryptocurrency. Uh, I'd be surprised if. Uh, the, the number was over 10% for any country around the world. Maybe there's some small countries that have reached 10% penetration, but uh, less than 10% certainly across the world. And like I said, 30 to 60 million people, depending upon how conservative you want to be with your estimates. And I'm an academic at heart, so I tend to prefer to be conservative. So closer to 30 million. If you look at number of active daily users or active monthly or even active annually users, this is a really tricky question because of you know, the, the, the hodling phenomenon with Bitcoin, right? Someone who's hodling and just holding Bitcoin for years, are they active? Well, it doesn't look like it when you look at the chain data, but I would argue they're very active. You know, they're just not moving it. Um, so what is an active user is something that's difficult to define and yeah, clarify. One more? No, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> Afterwards, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.